Hey, very good morning. I think it's still morning. Very, very good morning to all of you, and thank you for the introduction, Umesh and Gautam. Uh, I would like to focus mostly on uh, not the innovation that we have done in our company, but the lessons learned from successes and failures in applying innovation to manufacturing. Uh, <clears throat> this is more relevant to us as an industry because we hear a lot of talk today about applying innovation to improve productivity and quality in our manufacturing industry. That is easier said than done. You know? uh, a lot of times I've been asked, okay, that is all fine, we know, but <clears throat> How do you do that, you know, because uh, we don't have a culture of innovation in India for historical reasons. Uh, we've just opened up 20 years ago, and we are far behind some of the ad advanced markets by sometimes decades. Uh, how do we catch up? So I think I'll spend some time on what are things that we try to do, what are the successes, failures. I will dwell more on failures because I firmly believe that we learn more from failures than from successes. Success sometimes gets to our head. We don't understand why we succeeded. We keep doing the same thing till we fail. Uh, if we understood why we fail, we have some nice lessons learned which we could use for improvement. That's my firm belief. So over the next maybe 20 minutes, I would give you a brief profile of the company I worked in last and the experience I've gathered, the data that I've gathered mostly are from my 25 years of manufacturing experience, 15 of them in the automotive industry, so please uh, excuse me if there's an overindulgence in automotive examples. I will show you a little bit, you know, glimpse of the manufacturing excellence journey we started in Verac. Some deployment examples in various areas, including innovation in uh, manufacturing, a uh, little bit of, uh, I would say, dabbling in digitization. But mostly, I would like to talk about the lessons learned, why things succeed and why uh, things fail. We have, uh, at Varrock, done a roadmap to achieve manufacturing excellence. I believe this has scope for improvement. But I think it's quite generic enough for all of you to start thinking of a roadmap for your own organization. And lastly, with all those experience, I have tried to make an, a toolkit that you can refer to uh, while striving for excellence in manufacturing. So quickly, uh, I'll just talk about Varog. Uh, it has done fairly well in the last uh, 10, 15 years. It's a 25-year, 26-year-old company. It's now over 10,000 crores in uh, revenue, over 12,000 employees, 35 manufacturing centers, almost 1,000 R&D engineers. It's a global company, but it's an Indian company. It's a privately held Indian company, so it's a success story in itself. <clears throat> uh, it has two major sectors it operates in worldwide. There's one international lighting, exterior lighting sector in the automotive business, make exterior lighting systems, uh, world-class technologies. This came as a result of a large acquisition that was done five years back, and uh, we have had fairly good success in not only managing that acquisition, but also rectifying the gaps, as well as growing that uh, much, much more faster than the market growth anywhere in the world. <clears throat> the other sector is the domestic sector, which is focused mostly on two-wheeler products. Uh, these are diverse products. Barak is, I think, the most diverse supplier of uh, automotive components to the two-wheeler industry, which products ranging from powertrain forge machine components to uh, lighting systems, electrical electronics, and uh, polymer assemblies. So it's fairly diverse. Uh, the contribution of uh, each of the businesses are given uh, there is uh, just for information. But if you look at the growth uh, from something like 2,500 crores about seven years ago, they've grown to about 10,000 crores, fourfold increase, uh, and still doing that. And so this is a secret behind that. 
Uh, it's called profitable growth, and the profits are managed mostly by the manufacturing organization, which is why I would like to dwell on manufacturing today. What is it that we did? So <clears throat> the first thing we did five years ago was, you know, we were doing very well, but nobody was questioning why we are doing very well, and is there scope to improve on that? When I joined this organization with my 15 years and more experience almost entirely in uh, world-class multinationals, I was able to see that while we are doing well in India, the processes and practices are not world-class. So it's like a lotus growing in a pond. When there's rainfall, the pond level rises and the lotus rises. Right? When the rainfall stops, the lotus dies. So I saw that risk, and he said, let's, let's <clears throat> start putting a roadmap for improvements. The di biggest difficulty I had was nobody believed that there's scope for improvement. We are doing so well. We are growing at 15 20% every year, and profitable growth in double-digit profits. Very rare in the automotive industry in India or worldwide. <clears throat> so what we did was we uh, first convinced the business leaders to get a manufacturing assessment done. And this was done by a third party outside. I think this was Frost and Sullivan. And we looked at various systems uh, in manufacturing which we could rate. Now, if you look at the uh, chart above, there's uh, areas from customer focus to supply chain to schedule, uh, scheduling systems, asset cares, that's maintenance, and various elements of manufacturing systems that needs to be there for us to get excellent. We picked up four of our best plants. So each one represents one division. So there's a lighting division, there's a polymer, metallic, and electrical division. Those are the first four uh, in the legend up there. Then the bottommost legend, which is the blue line, is the average of the top three manufacturing industries in India, not just in automotive, but across all sectors. So the first eye-opener was was that our best plants are somewhere 15 to 20% less efficient than the best Indian manufacturing companies. Uh, that was a big uh, shocker for all of us. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing was there was enough variability in the systems and practices that we had. If you see, you know, some of the plants are good in scheduling, white, not good in visual management. So, they're not consistent across the plants. We are following, you know, individual practices and systems in each plant. We estimated that if we are 15 to 20 percent below Indian benchmarks, we should be about 30 to 40 percent below worldwide benchmarks. And the last thing was the manufacturing system were not documented and hence not sustainable. They were run by some competent people who one day would retire and that would be the end of uh, the manufacturing system, how good that would be. So this, these are the risks that we assessed in 2011-12. And we said that we should now get on with some improvement uh, in initiatives. So there were many initiatives. I will not name all of them, but I'll pick up uh, mostly a few of them uh, focused on manufacturing. And uh, we had been doing, you know, implementing TPM since 2008. I think most of you must have been doing the same. We didn't see much improvement, nothing wrong with TPM. It was the way we were implementing it. And I'll talk about that in a later slides. We introduced innovation in processes. So we, we had some fairly intense manufacturing from uh, heavy forging to hay treatments, uh, coatings, molding. So we had quite a few manufacturing operations. And after 20 years of being in molding business, we couldn't call ourselves an innovator in molding. We were probably the best practitioners, but we were not innovating in molding or forging. So we said we would like to now start a innovation capability focused on manufacturing processes, not on products only, but on on manufacturing process. So some of the examples were, uh, you know, of course, it all started with automation, but that's really not innovation. That's just applying some productivity tools. 
but I'll probably talk about a couple of them, a deep hole drilling of uh, engine valves, uh, laser welding of engine valves, axial forming of trans transmission gears. These are new processes, and I'll talk about them in the next few slides uh, in, as examples. We also had initiatives to improve enterprise systems, so connectivity, you know, connecting uh, our internal departments, connecting our suppliers and customers to our internal systems. Uh, business intelligence tool to make data more visible to the management so that you could have more effective and quicker decisions. And lastly, digitization, which we are talking more often than not almost in every conference. So, you know, we, we have, we had several dozens of initi uh, initiatives uh, and uh, examples, but I would like to just pick up three of them and talk in detail on those. The first one was an innovation in a process. Engine valves is one of our products. In fact, we are the fastest growing engine valve maker and I think now number two engine valve maker in India. When I joined five years back, we were probably number five. Uh, <clears throat> and one of the reasons is the kind of initiative we put in innovation, both in product and process. So it started with product innovation. We saw the future. The engine valves are solid engine valves. You I don't think I show, yeah. So I, I show a hollow engine valve, that's the future. We said that the future would be lightweight engine valves and high temperature engine valves. So lightweight, you know, one of the things we said was to make it a little bit hollow. Now, to make it hollow, you need to d drill a deep hole, fairly deep hole in a very narrow part. The stem of the valve that you see, the vertical section, is a maximum of four millimeters there. And the hole you drill has a diameter of 2 mm, and it has to be so straight that it doesn't introduce any uh, lateral stresses while in operation. So, drilling is not a difficult technology, but deep hole drilling of such a narrow hole, uh, you know, also wasn't uh, so difficult when I told my guys that we should do that. But when they started doing this, uh, there was a lot of failures, you know, breakages. You know. So, what we were missing was an analysis of the new process before we actually tried the new process. So in this case, what we did was, we then went to a world-class institute, uh, Fraunhofer Institute of Technology, and uh, <clears throat> together we did a project. It was uh, their role to do a design analysis of the new process. So it was all done on uh, virtual engineering. Uh, there was no prototyping, there was no making of tools uh, and uh, machines before it was validated on computer. So that was an expertise we didn't have. I searched for universities in India that could do that. We didn't have that, surprising. <clears throat> but uh, these guys, uh, to make the story, start, uh, sh story short, they gave us a six month timeline and they did it in six months, not a day more. Uh, and they gave the detailed plan to us on day one. Executed it brilliantly well. <clears throat> That's something we are missing in our company and I'm sure in most of the Indian companies. It's called program management. <clears throat> so then we had a uh, focus mostly on the process tool and design, but all virtual pro designs. And when it was proven virtually that you could do that, that's when we made the first prototypes and uh, all 150 of them were tested and passed. The next step we did was to make sure a valve that would go higher temperatures. These valves typically stay uh, about 400 to 700 degrees, not more. But with engines becoming smaller and smaller and with turbocharging and boosting, the combustion temperatures are higher and higher. So we needed uh, either the same materials that could be cooled faster or new materials which are expensive that can stand higher heat. So we went for the first one. Uh, same materials because cost is a prime uh, uh, concern for all customers. So we didn't change the design of the material. We said we'll fill them with storium. Not a new technology, it's a known concept. <clears throat> so that was the second uh, focus. Filling with sodium is not such a uh, complex job, but once you fill it, to plug the hole at the top or at the bottom of the valve, which is about uh, 2 mm, plug it with a 2 mm uh, little plug and weld it, weld a circumference uh, 
of about you know, 2 mm diameter, a circle of about 2 mm diameter, quickly in less than a second. That was a challenge. So we experimented with laser welding, also at front of Institute. That's what is shown up there. And uh, it was proven. <clears throat> so we have now, I think we are probably one company which have the ability to plug weld either from the drill, either from the top or the bottom, and plug weld either by laser or by friction welding. All this, the ideas were created in-house, but the expertise we sourced from outside. Uh, and uh, at the end of the six-month project, this was successfully launched into production. We are selling this to Chrysler now in US. So that's a success story I would, would like to uh, talk about. Next few slides, I'll talk what went behind this success. This is one example. <clears throat> Another example of uh, manufacturing and innovation was uh, gears. Gears are typically, we make uh, transmission gears for uh, two wheelers, complete assembly. And uh, they're made by uh, for, uh, forging a blank into a near net shape, and then a lot of machining to remove the material to the finer tolerances. Here also, it's driven primarily by cost because the design is not ours. Design belongs to the customer. Now, to reduce any cost here, we had to think of saving all the materials that we are cutting. You know, if we can afford not to cut away the material, somehow forge it to a near net shape, we could save that 10 to 15 material uh, that we are just uh, machining it away. So the idea was. Uh, also from inside of Varok that can we, for, can we form it to the final shape instead of hobbing, which is a material removal process. Again, uh, the, uh, the process design, the tool design, die design was all done by Fraunhofer here, again, all on computer. And once it was uh, validated, uh, <coughs> this is an axial forming process, so you have a uh, upper and lower tool, and uh, the die is a negative of the gear that we want. Compensated for some, some allowance given to compensate for flow, but it's really a negative of the die, and then the process is just a high frequency forming in uh, one direction, that is uniaxial. So it's a high frequency, that means it'll press and release, press and release, press and release, very, at very high frequency, and we had given a cycle time equal to the hobbing uh, process that we had, 17 seconds. So in 17 seconds, it can high frequency uh, form a gear. <clears throat> the technology was proven on several gears, several complicated shapes, uh, one with kidney holes also. But uh, this one is an example of uh, a project that was a partial success, and I'll also explain why. So the technology was developed, but the project was shelved. That's why I call it a partial success. We didn't productionize so far. This one took two years. The previous one took six months. The next example is on a simpler process, molding, uh, polymer molding. Uh, this is driven by uh, rejections, reduced rejections. Now, we have a molding assembly, which is a center console of a car, that is the armrest panel in the front seat, between the front seats. There are several uh, polymer molds we make, and the final assembly is done to make the final product in-house. So there's, you know, 15 different moldings. I've only shown three as example, but all those 15 moldings are done, uh, and then it wait as uh, work in progress before uh, the final assembly. Final assembly is done inspection is done and shipped to customer. That's a very simplistic uh, process flow diagram. The problem here was uh, very high rejections and very high work in process inventory. Uh, so it was holding up a lot of cash here. Now mind you, this is a very high volume business. Uh, uh, we are making something like uh, 150,000 assemblies a day. So it's, you know, you can't afford to stop the line even for a few minutes. Uh, that will be production loss. So the focus was always on production, 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 and we were uh, losing a lot in terms of high inventory and working process and high rejections. 
So we said, you know, uh, let's reduce the working process inventory as step one. And uh, when we thought about it, we said we'll have to re-engineer the process and then apply some uh, uh, traceability so that we know where inventory is being created and uh, we can monitor and track those. So the focus was on introducing a manufacturing execution system here uh, and to re-engineer the manufacturing process before we uh, uh, put the new system in place and then introduce barcoding as a first step. And of course, we had to retrain or restaff the workers who are operating this. Those were the uh, few focus areas. <clears throat> Unfortunately, during implementation, re-engineering was, although it was planned, it was not implemented because the plant management thought there were too high costs. Barcoding was done uh, at the final inspection and not at the molding steps. So ideally, in our re-engineered process, barcoding should have been done in molding one, molding two, molding three, and all 15 stations so that you don't, you are tracking the work in process inventory created and you run the, uh, final assembly with no uh, work in process inventory. That was the initial intent. But because the project cost was high, the project cost included the hardware, the mechatronics hardware, the software, and the implementation cost. It ran into two and a half crores for a plant of about uh, 200 crores uh, uh, within a budget year that was found to be too expensive by the management. So what they said was, okay, let's do barcoding at the final station only. So we didn't re-engineer the process. Instead, we implemented the barcoding on an existing process. And since it was an existing process, we did not think the staff had to be trained enough on that. Now the result of all this was that the working process inventory continues to be at the same level and the rejections continues to be at the same level because rejections are create, created at the molding one, two, three, uh, and mostly and handling uh, before the final assembly. Nothing changed. We spent about 40 lakhs in this one. And this is a project I call a failure. And I'll uh, now next come to the summary of all these three. Uh, as, as a hindsight, if uh, we had just looked at how much we are losing in, uh, in uh, uh, bad products and working process inventory. That was roughly about 1.2 crores a year. We thought two and a half crores cost was too much. So we continued to use lose uh, 1.2 crores a year on that 200 crore revenue. The plant has grown to 300 crores, so the rejections are now higher. So that's on high hindsight. This is why I call it a failure. To summarize all these three, uh, I'd like to dwell on this one. The first one, we had complete management buy-in before we started the project. The management thought that this is a good project. Why? Because there was a customer pull. Customer was asking for lightweight project products. And in this case, there was an RFQ from Chrysler for hollow valves. So they had no option. That's why the buy-in came in. There was a business need. We partnered the best in the world for developing the technology. The business put dedicated resources. They're not you know, uh, temporary resources from another project. So they're dedicated and trained for this one. So because they're trained, at SOP, there's complete compliance to the SOP evolved. So that's why we call this a success. The second one, the gear forming project. The buy-in part, there were three business heads during the two years this project went. So, it took more time convincing the next business set that this is a project of importance. So eventually I conclude that there was no serious buying from the successor. There was no apparent customer pull. There was a business need because we had to make our products cheaper, uh, but there was no apparent customer pull. <coughs> customer was not asking for a, <coughs> excuse me, customer was not asking for an axial farming process. They were just asking for a cheaper gear. So while it fulfilled the customer requirement of a cheaper gear, because the customer did not ask for axial farming, there's no buying for this. Although we partnered the best uh, partner in the world for this one, 
there was no dedicated resources because of no buying in and there was no training uh, completed for these guys. So that's why I say partial. The technology was developed because of the partner, but there's no implementation to production because of management buy-in. That's, I think, a very common uh, story across all failures we've had so far. <clears throat> the last one is the uh, manufacturing execution on a molding line and the bar, what, I, what we call just the bar coding project. This again, there, was, there were changes in the plant head, uh, so there was no serious buy-in by the successors. Uh, there was a business need and there was a customer pull in this case, but the budget cut is what impacted everything and compromised on the initial scope of work here. And hence, no dedicated resources, instability in the workforce, process redesign was not done prior to the digitization. So while process design, redesign was done, it was not implemented. And since, so this I call a total failure. This is something one should never do. If you know that a process has to be re-engineered before implementation. If there's no budget for it, you would rather not do the project. <clears throat> That's the learning from this one, so it's completely red. <clears throat> there are several projects we did. It is not just based on these three. I think there are about 30 or 40 such projects, and I can classify into these three categories. As a result of it, what we said was, you know, to achieve excellence, we need to follow a certain sequence. And so we built a manufacturing excellence roadmap. On the vertical axis, we have uh, technology uh, complexity or the complexity of the application of technology. And on the uh, horizontal line, we basically have a sequence. <clears throat> so the first one I call individual skills. You first need those. And I've categorized them also. Basic industrial engineering practices, basic manufacturing engineering practices. System engineering, process automation. This is not electron application of electronics, mind you. Process automation is, uh, I would probably call it uh, uh, minus the electronics. <clears throat> and then manufacturing systems. These are what one should have in your R&D group in manufacturing. Before you attempt the next one, that is application of electronics. This is, so the first one is, uh, if you have all of those in your R&D group, you are probably excellent at industry 2.0 level. The next is use of electronics and IT. That's industry 3.0. This is where you apply electronics to process and uh, uh, automation, use of data acquisition, use of uh, process controls, all the PLC that we talk about is this, virtual design tools. Uh, so this use of IT comes next. <clears throat> The third one is, once you are good at this, which is industry 3.0, you start to then uh, realize more value by collaborating across either functions or supply st stream, value stream. So this is where manufacturing execution systems come in place, product data management, so P part of PLM, uh, and then collaboration either with the customer or supply chain. That's the next one. <coughs> This requires connected systems. You could have these connected systems within a local area network, need not be internet. Then the next in line is use of internet or larger uh, area networks, wider area networks. Data acquisition from legacy machines is by itself a technology that's developed. <clears throat> Complete factory automation, uh, including new processes like 3D printing. And the last one, one is what we call big data. It's not data analytics, it's big data analytics. So big data means data that has uh, uh, videos and uh, movies, so really large number of bytes, mega and terabytes of data. Augmented reality and artificial intelligence. So that is the sequence which we think we should use in order to squeeze out the maximum from these investments. <coughs> Now, also let's take a look at where is the world on this one. <clears throat> As you go from left to right, the cost of manufacturing actually goes up. But then the value add also should go up. If the value add doesn't go up, you shouldn't attempt those. If I take the case of Germany, you know, in history, the 
the first you know industry 2.0 was complete in the early parts of the century and they made the best i'm just taking germany as an example there's also us ahead of that at that time but i'm just taking germany because it's still focused in manufacturing us seem to have gotten out of manufacturing <clears throat> so early 1900s uh, i think they mastered the first set that is industry 2.0 in the 70s and 80s, they mastered 3.0, that's use of electronics and IT. Uh, 90s and 2000 is the collaboration part. That's all the PLM that uh, we, talk, we hear from uh, big companies like Bosch and Siemens. And then now, this last decade or last few years, uh, there we hear talk about the industry 4.0, which is digitization or augmented reality and artificial intelligence. This is this is okay because they're adept at one, two, and three. And I'm talking about four, that's the right uh, sequence. And also it's relevant for their industry because their labor is extremely uh, expensive and few. They're not producing any more labor. <clears throat> I think it's easier for them to produce machines. For us, I think it's easier to produce labor, so we may have to follow a different uh, curve. Uh, as you can see in the first industry 2.0, up to in 2. there was a, you know, almost a 30, 40 year gap. That's history. But over the years, we have managed to narrow some of that. At least we are talking about uh, uh, industry uh, application of 2 and 3. There are enough case studies in the industry today. 4, we are just talking about it. <clears throat> so more important than this this is you know is to look at where are we in india today so if i take a snapshot on this roadmap for india this is how it fares <coughs> so the blue ones are the ones where we think we are prepared or we're ready the yellow ones are the ones where we think we have some work to do and the red ones we are clearly not prepared so if you see the individual skill set that is in, in, in an R&D group that you have, a manufacturing R&D group, we lack system engineering. That means how to piece the smaller pieces of the puzzle into the larger picture. <coughs> this is in, you know, in a uh, lean engineering language, you know, balancing the line. You, know, you may optimize a station but if you have not balanced with another station, you create work in process inventory. That's a waste. So you look at the larger picture and try to design the system first before getting into the subsystem design. And the process engineering is a subsystem design. <coughs> many systems. I do not know of uh, uh, too many companies in India that have a documented manufacturing system manual. It takes some years of expertise to start writing this. And uh, just the fact that we don't have written manufacturing system manuals means that we have more to go. The <clears throat> use of IT, uh, luckily, uh, we are pretty prepared, primarily because this is an entirely different industry doing that. This is IT industry. So these skill sets, the virtual design, the uh, PLC and data equation are not provided within this industry of manufacturing, they come as a service by the IT industry. So IT industry seems to be prepared uh, well before the manufacturing industry is. <clears throat> so collaboration between these is what you've seen in the last two decades to enable us to get into industry 3.0, which is all, all this automation and use of IT. <clears throat> the collaboration part also, you see the IT companies trying to push through some softwares for collaboration. But here I put it yellow because for a simple reason, collaboration means one party cannot implement the entire solution. It has to discuss with the manufacturing industry on a whole system before implementation. Now, if the manufacturing industry is not ready with system engineering and manufacturing systems, no matter how mature your software is, that connect will never happen between, and you will never get your optimal manufacturing execution system or connectivity uh, between the various stakeholders. This is our learning from some of the experiments we have tried. <clears throat> so I suggest that if you do a gap assessment and find that you don't have system engineering or manufacturing uh, systems 
knowledge. Please do not uh, attempt a manufacturing execution system. Uh, more often than not, what is happening is the manufacturing company relies on the IT service provider to give them a manufacturing execution system. It works, but when you have to improve upon them, that's when it turns out to be very expensive. You will be at the mercy of the technology provider, that's IT service company. <clears throat> the next ones, if you see data captured directly from machines is something we probably are doing. But if, <clears throat> if you're not ready with Industry 3.0, please do not attempt 4.0, because 4.0 requires 3 as a prerequisite. I've, I've heard that can we skip this process of 3 before going to 4? We're done? Sure, thanks. So the last slide is, you know, I've kind of put a excellence toolkit. How do you attempt going through that sequence really depends on where you are. You know, there are different tools for different baselines. Uh, <clears throat> on the left side, I have put the baseline measurement in terms of your process capability. Uh, you could do it in terms of PPMs or, you know, quality uh, measures or productivity measures. They all end up being the same. So if you are, you know, if your in-house rejection, so to say, is around that 1.5 sigma, which is an in-house rejection of 10 to the power 4 ppm. That means you are dependent on the right side. If you see, you are dependent on daily supervision to get the job done. So the next stage for you is to make sure you have a stable, disciplined, and trained labor. The next stage is not automation or industry 4.0. Next stage is simply have more process control. That will take you from 10 to the power 4 ppm to 10 to the power 3 ppm. That's the 3 sigma. So 3 sigma, of companies that are at 3 sigma are the ones that have a good manufacturing system in place and following them. Now, just by having a good manufacturing system and following them will not take you beyond 3 sigma. You need something different. And that's where process automation comes. So you require automation if you have to go from three sigma to above. That means you have to reduce your rejections, let's say from 10 to power three to 10 to power two. But mind you, if you do not have stable and capable processes, please do not attempt automation. You will not see the benefits as I told you in the last example. You will end up spending costs, you will not see the benefits because automation, automated, uh, the machines have to have a certain level of capability on the part of the process. And then the last one is, if you want to improve upon that further, uh, you need to start looking at the design of the process. So maybe introduce smart manufacturing system. Maybe connect the system, identify the, you will most likely find that the bottleneck is not within your manufacturing, but maybe in the value stream outside of it. Maybe your customer, maybe your supplier. So that's where you need to connect these guys, right? So this is a short summary. What you'll find that as you go up uh, the ladder, your productivity and quality improves, and your total cost should come down if you follow the right sequence. If it is done right, the total cost does come down. If it ain't done right, you will find your spending cost, but you're not getting the benefits. What is also important about this is, if you're down here, it's very easy to see where your uh, improvement areas are. But the moment you are already at 10 to power 2 people, it's very difficult to see where to improve upon. Right? So that's why it's more important that you follow the sequence. So to conclude, first is you have to understand your own baseline. And the tools you apply depends on that baseline. Understand also the customer requirement and business requirement. If your competition is not at that industry four point level for the next 10 years, should you attempt it and make yourself more expensive is a simple business decision. <clears throat> so summarizing this, uh, your appropriate manufacturing system, whether it's manual or automated or connected or smart, depends really on uh, your baseline, your process capability, and the gaps that you see between yourself and the business environment, which is the competition. This is all I had to share. Uh, we can probably uh, uh, discuss more in the question-answer session. I thank you very much for your attention.
<clears throat> I'm available for questions for the next five minutes, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Tomodar. Uh, we perhaps have uh, questions for about three, four minutes. Uh, floor is open for questions. Good morning, sir. Um, thank you for the lecture. Hope you are listening me. I can hear you. I can't see you because of that bright light okay. behind you. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Uh, see, my one question is, if you go back to your uh, manufacturing excellence scale, can you open? Yeah. Uh, in this, uh, where this, um, like a teamwork and uh, collaboration between the departments and uh, rigor in execution. That kind of human skills also, I feel it should get included somewhere. Yeah, those are basic hygiene items. Um, when, you, when you are all by yourself, teamwork has no relevance, right? But when you are working in a team, that's the first thing that should be there. It's a basic hygiene item. I've, I've made this chart assuming they are there. If they're not there, you look at uh, my last slide here, the bottommost, I call that situation chaos. So if you don't have that, there's utter chaos. You know, I think you should fix those first. And they are the most important things. And this is a, a good question because we tend to uh, either ignore the importance of that part or we just do not address them, even if we know they're important. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Uh, uh, on your left side corner, it's the very front vertical, Oscar. Morning. Uh, thank you very much for sharing the failures, which I think very important uh, for everybody. Uh, my question is on this manufacturing excellence toolkit that you tried to talk about. I was very much impressed when you said uh, there is no point to go to industry 4.0 without 3.0 being addressed. And the point that stable and capable, pro capable processes are very important makes a lot of sense. Uh, having said that, if we achieve stable and capable processes, graduate to the next level, what should be the first step is what is my question. Yeah, I think uh, you should understand always where the bottleneck is. Like initially you are focused in manufacturing. When you clean up manufacturing, then you'll find that the bottleneck is in the parts coming in. So then you clean up the supply chain. Then we clean up the supply chain, you find that the bottleneck is in the schedule variation from the customer. So then you connect them and clean up that. So always when you, uh, it's just like a manufacturing line, you know, you, you have a bottleneck station all the time if it's not 100% balanced. When you resolve that, another step becomes a bottleneck. Then you resolve that, another becomes. So this is like that, right? So you have to understand in your entire value stream where's your bottleneck. That always is the next step. So if you are already at three and your processes are capable, the next question that should be asked is, how far is your competition away from you? The second, uh, the second 